Jesus' teaching offers not just a criticism of the, the traditional Greco-Roman warrior ethic, but rather a radical inversion of the entire value system of the world that he lived in. Like us, the ancient Romans and Jews had their own intuitive sense of what was right and wrong, good and bad, valuable and not valuable, which they used to navigate through the world. Jesus shocks his audience by calling into question these value systems and positing a new one that seems to be just the opposite. We're used to thinking of highly educated and intelligent people as being smarter than the less educated. Better educated people tend to enjoy more prestige and be more respected in society. This was no different in the ancient Greek and Roman world, where we've already seen a number of figures from Odysseus to Thales to Solon praised for their intelligence. Jesus, however, turns this around. In one passage, he says, quote, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Thus, the truth is, in fact, hidden from those who are regarded as wise and intelligent. Instead, it's the children who are usually thought to be ignorant of so many things who, in fact, know the truth. This might well be conceived as a part of Jesus' criticism of the traditional teachers of Jewish law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were regarded as the educated class of society, but whose knowledge made them blind to many things. This is one of many passages in which Jesus praises children. In response to his disciples' question about heaven, Jesus has a child come in and says, quote, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble, like a child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In the world, children are not given the same rights as adults. They are under the authority of their parents, and only when they reach a certain age of maturity are they allowed to make their own decisions and manage their own affairs. Thus, we are used to thinking of children as not fully active members of society and as lacking legal authority and rights. But Jesus says that children have certain qualities, such as humility, that make them more suitable for the kingdom of heaven. Instead of children learning from adults in order to participate in society, as in the model we're familiar with, Jesus suggests just the opposite. We as adults must learn from the children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Thus it's clear that for whatever it amounts to in the end, the kingdom of heaven is in many ways an inversion of mundane society where different values apply. The specific quality of children that Jesus extols is humility. As we've seen from, for example, Odysseus' boasting to the Cyclops or Croesus' gloating over his great wealth, humility did not have any particularly high premium in the ancient world where the warrior ethic was dominant. Jesus also, presumably again, has in mind the arrogance of the Pharisees and Sadducees in his own culture. By contrast, he claims people must make themselves humble if they want to enter the kingdom of heaven even though in the mundane world the rewards of life tend to go not to the humble, but to those who ostentatiously parade their achievements. Jesus enjoins the disciples to follow him and ignore the risks that they might run in doing so. In a somewhat enigmatic passage, he says, quote, For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? It's a natural human reaction to run from danger, but Jesus seems to suggest that what's perceived as danger in this world is only relevant for this world. The point seems to be that to lose one's life in this world is not the worst thing that can happen. He implies a new meaning to the term life, whereby it involves an existence in some other sphere beyond the mundane. Here, he inverts the intuitive understanding of what life usually means. As in antiquity, in our modern world, we tend to take wealth as the measure of success. We admire and envy people with expensive clothes, large houses, fast cars, yachts, private jets, etc. These familiar trappings of wealth seem to testify to a life of industry and diligence. But Jesus inverts this picture and seems to criticize the rich. He tells people to sell their belongings and give the proceeds to the poor. He explains to his disciples, quote, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Similar, similarly, he claims in a different passage, quote, you cannot serve God and wealth. 
thus implying that wealth is antithetical to a truly pious disposition. Here again, we can see an overt inversion of the values of this world. Instead of being envied and admired, rich people should be pitied since they will be denied access to the new kingdom. The Roman world that Jesus was familiar with had a large number of slaves who performed different tasks for their owners. The slaves represented the lowest rung of society, having no legal rights and being at the mercy of the moods of their owners. Jesus again inverts the value system of the slave state and raises the slave to a heightened status. He says, quote, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. He repeats this in another passage when he says, quote, the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Here again, he appeals to humility as a virtue, as with his description of children. The goal should not be to have others serving one, but rather to serve others. Jesus implies that his mission is precisely that of a servant. Here we see another case of Jesus inverting the existing values by raising up the underprivileged elements of society. The suggestion that he is himself a, ser a servant constitutes a stark contrast to the traditional Greco-Roman conceptions of what a hero or a great person is. In all of these cases, Jesus can be seen as proposing a radical inversion of values from the accepted norms of the day. Instead of being rich, it's better to be poor. Instead of being a master, it's better to be a servant or a slave. Instead of being strong and self-confident, it's better to be humble. Instead of being educated and intelligent, it's better to be uneducated like a child. To appreciate the radicalism of this, think of the most valued ideas in our modern times and then imagine rejecting them and replacing them with their opposites.